Morning, everyone. How are we doing? Questions while we wait for others to come in? Why don't I start us off with the following? As a reminder of what we were doing last time, well, I mean, it's just what we were doing last time, right? So, no worries there. Why don't we take a moment to draw the domain here? You know what the domain is. x squared plus y squared less than or equal to 3. You know that, that is a circle of radius root 3. And we want x and y bigger than or equal to 0. So this is your domain D. So you know what to do, right? Continuous function on a closed and bounded domain attains an absolute max and an absolute min. Where can these occur? These can only occur at critical points or on the boundary. Let's look for critical points of f. Partial derivative of f with respect to x is y squared. Partial derivative of f with respect to y is 2xy. What are the critical points in order for, well, first of all, partial derivatives exist everywhere. So the only critical points are where these are going to be zero. So if this is equal to zero, that implies y is zero. And if y is zero, then this whole thing is equal to zero. So y equals zero it was just luck. Well, you know my circles aren't usually that good, right? So if y is zero, this whole thing is zero. So critical points, regardless of what x is, as long as y is zero, 
As long as y is zero, we're good to go. So the whole x-axis is critical points. So in particular, this whole line segment, which is in the domain. Matthew is asking uh, the good question. That's exactly what we're going to do today. Today we're going to see an alternate approach to finding max and min on the domain. So you, you see, we don't get the domain from this function. This is the domain. The domain is given, and then you have this function hovering above. And we're looking for the values, the maximum values this function attains, and the minimum values the function attains. So here are the critical points, which coincide with the boundary, right? So now let's look at the boundary. Let's call this C1, C2, C3. The boundary is made up of three pieces, right? So on C1, this is just a straight line. You know how to describe that. Right, every point on C1, on C1, X is zero. So every point has the form zero C, where Y, I mean zero Y, where Y goes from zero to root three. So if we look at our function, on zero y, well, of course, that's equal to zero. Y is the three, I don't know what you're referring to, sorry. What, what little d are you referring to here? On C2, Again, the equation of the circle. Well, that was just given, right? X squared plus Y squared less than or equal to three. It was given. Y equal there's no difference, right? I'm calling it zero y just to mix things up. Zero t, if you're if you want to look at the uh, equation of the line segment, right? It's a it's the equation of a line in uh, goes through the point zero zero and with uh, direction vector zero one, so zero t, and there's really no difference, right? Whether you look at the function on zero y or on zero t, it's still the same thing. So I'm just looking at it differently, but there's no difference. On c2, Again, every point, right, has y coordinate zero. So this has the form x zero, or if you prefer, t zero. When you look at the line segment, the equation of the line in parametric form, where x here varies from zero to root three, and of course your function on x zero is still going to be zero. 
And finally, on C3, Well, in, in this case, right, they do overlap, as Mies is suggesting, C2 and the critical points overlap, so we don't need to consider both, but we need to consider at least one of them, right, so whatever. Yeah, Y is F of X is zero equal to zero, well, what is F of X, Y? F of X, Y was given, I mean, I've just rubbed it off now, but it was given as x, y squared. So if you plug in the point x is zero, in other words, when y is zero, the whole thing is zero. And now on C3, well, what is C3? C3 is the part of the circle x squared plus y squared is equal to three. Or y is the square root of 3 minus x squared. The positive square root, right, because you're only here, and only half of the whole half circle, so in other words, only a quarter of the circle, where x varies from 0 to root 3, right? So only this quarter circle right here. So both C1 and C2 are absolute minimum in this case, right? I mean, it's easy to understand that since you're restricting your attention to the first quadrant, this is always going to be bigger than or equal to zero. And since the function is zero on both of these line segments, that will, of course, turn out to be the minimum. Absolutely. Very nice observation there. And now on C3, you see that every point on C3 has the form x square root of 3 minus x squared. Then actually, normally the answer would have been yes, right? Dan is suggesting, shouldn't you maximize and minimize your function on C1 and C2? But in this case, on C1 and C2, the function is just a constant function. So there's really nothing to do here, right? Normally, normally you'd get a function of y. We would expect a function of y here. And you would expect a function of x here. And then you'd have to maximize and minimize these functions corresponding to these values of y or these values of x, respectively. Here, however, constant, we're done. So you see that every point on C3 looks like this, right? And so now your function over on on C3 which is x y squared right so everywhere you see y you replace with this so we get x 3 minus x squared or 3x minus x cubed and this as Dan was suggesting there this we need to maximize on this closed and bounded interval. But now you have a function of one variable and you know exactly how to do that. So take the derivative and you see the critical points. plus or minus one, but minus one is out because it's not in 
the center wall. So this function, let, let's call that function, can I call that g of x for the moment? g of x will have a maximum and a minimum on this interval. Where does it occur? It occurs either at the critical, at, at the critical point or at the end points. So if we look at g of zero, well, that's easily seen to be zero. G of root three is what? That's three root three minus three root three. That's zero again. And at one, this is three minus one, which is two. And now we're done. We're going to put everything together. Right? So here, you have these values of importance on C3. You had your critical points, which in this case completely overlap with C2. And on C1 and C2, your function was identically zero. So, so F has an absolute minimum of zero occurring on the x and y axes and an absolute max of two occurring at the point one root two. It's always nice, Nilloy, right? As Nilloy suggests, it's always nice to ask yourself does this make sense? Right? Does this question make sense? Do these answers make sense? And we certainly observe that for the minimum, it makes complete sense, right? This function on the first quadrant when x and y are bigger than or equal to zero, this is going to be bigger than or equal to zero. It's never going to be negative. And, and since it is zero on both x and y axes, then that's going to be the minimum. So that makes a lot of sense. For the maximum, it's, it's hard to see that two is the max. Right? I mean, we probably couldn't have guessed that without doing some work. But, you know, I mean, it's always nice to plug in a few values and make sure that you don't get anything bigger than two. So lots of questions are rising here. Some people ask, what about the inside? Well, we checked for the inside, right? That's, that was our first thing. The first thing we did was look for critical points. And we only had, the, the only critical points occurred on this line segment. So there were no critical points inside. Uh, second question, where does the root two come from? You know where it comes from. Right, when here we saw that it was maximized when x is one. But when x is one, the y coordinate is root two, right? I mean, it's right here. When x is one, y is root two. All right. 
How are we doing here? Why do we find G of one? Then we don't use it. No, no, we use it. We use it. That's our maximum. That is the maximum. And where does it occur? It occurs when x is 1 or at the point 1 root 2. Marie is asking why is this true, but you know that f of xy is xy squared, right? So here I'm looking on this part of the circle only. So plug this in for y, and you get you get the function that was stated right there. Questions? Let's take a step back and realize what we're doing when we are restricting our attention to the domain. Isn't what root, what isn't what two and not root two the point? No. This is the x, y point, whereas this is the z value, right? So this point, this point lives on C3. When x is one, y is root two. Right, so I mean, we're trying to maximize and minimize functions on a closed and bounded domain. The idea is that the max and min can only occur either at critical points or on the boundary. Adam R, we didn't need to check for the second derivative test because because we know we have an absolute max and an absolute min. And these can only occur at critical points or on the boundary. So whatever the maximum is, is going to be the maximum. And to answer Alessandra's question, Alvin Eloy just did that, negative one is not in the domain. Exactly that. So let's... Right, so, so, so back to what we're doing, maximizing and minimizing functions inside some closed and bounded domain. Absolute max and min can only occur at critical points or along the boundary. And what does the boundary look like? The boundary, so, so you know, you wanna maximize some function and if we're restricting our attention to the boundary, The boundary can be described in this way, right? So, right, I mean, here we had x squared plus y squared equals three. So something like this, some function of x and y equal to a constant. So maximize or minimize some function subject Right, so, so here I'm just looking at the boundary. That's what we're going to focus on today. And what are we looking for? We're looking for We're looking for, let's say we want to maximize, we're looking for the largest value of C such that f of x, y equal to C still satisfies this.
But you know what this is. This is a family of level curves. So let's think of drawing this family of level curves. Right, so you have this family of level curves. And then you have this, which, although the K doesn't change, is really a level curve for some fixed value of K. So this is going to be some sort of boundary thing. It's bad. It's bad, it's bad. I have to start over. It was too quick with the drawing of the G there. But well, let's start again with those level curves. This family of level curves. And then you've got this function G. Maybe looking something like this. And what are we looking for? We're looking for the largest value of C for which these two things still intersect. Right? So you see that C is allowed to vary. Here it intersects. Here it intersects. And now suddenly, for this largest one, it only intersects at one point, right? And then it doesn't intersect anymore if you take C to be larger. So we're looking for this largest value of C for which they still intersect. Well, what can we say at this value of C? We we can say that the tangent line to this function, right, the line that just touches the function at one point is going to be the same as the tangent line to this function, the function which, the, the line which just intersects at one point. So they share a common tangent line at this point. So they share a common tangent line, and so they share a common normal line. Now you know that the gradient is normal to the level surface or to the level curve. So the gradient of F is going to be the normal. But G is also a level curve. So the gradient of G is also going to be the normal. So in order for this to happen, you need the gradient of F to be a multiple of the gradient of G. And this is the idea behind Lagrange multipliers. This is a way for you to treat the boundary in another fashion by forcing the gradient of F to be a multiple of the gradient of G.
Let's consider a few examples. We are asked to maximize and minimize, or really optimize, the function subject subject to the given conditions. So there it is. So Lagrange multipliers tells us that we need the gradient of f to be a multiple of the gradient of g. That's, a, that's exactly what we're doing, right? We're using it to point us in the right direction. I'm not sure what your question is. Is the subject a part of the domain? So let, let, let's see this in, uh, in practice. What do we want? We want the gradient of f to be the multiple of the gradient of G. The gradient of F is the normal line to the level curve, that's right. Well, we'll see, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens, right? So what is the gradient of F? So gradient of F, which is df dx df dy, in this case, 2xy and x squared, gradient of g, right? This is your g here. So gradient of g is 2x, 4y cubed. So in order for gradient of f to be equal to the gradient of g, be a multiple of 2x for y cubed. Or buffering already? back. Very good. Thank you. Right, so we have these two vectors equal to each other. So we need 2xy to be lambda 2x and x squared to be 4y to be lambda 4y cubed. Coupled with this equation, which is still in play, right? Where x squared plus y squared plus y to the 4 is equal to 5. So, I forget who was asking, but how does this give you back a point? Well, I mean, observe what's happening here. One equation, two equations, three equations. We have three equations, three unknowns. So there it is. Three equations, three unknowns.
So the three equations are unknown. Solve however you want. Let's bring the two, let's bring this to the other side. So we have 2xy minus 2 lambda x equal to zero. If I factor out a 2x, I'm left with y minus lambda. So we see that x is equal to zero or y is equal to lambda. If x is equal to zero, If x is equal to zero from this third equation, we see that y has to be plus or minus the fourth root of five. Lambda is a constant. Lambda, well, lambda Lambda is a constant, right? We are, we suggested that in the Lagrange multipliers idea, you needed the gradients to be multiples of each other. Now, even though you have three equations through unknowns, you don't necessarily need to solve for lambda, right? Because the only thing that is important to you is what X and Y are. So here, if x is zero, I don't need to worry about lambda if I can solve for y immediately. So right away from here, I have these two points, zero, four through to five, and zero, negative four through to five. And if y is lambda, what happens then? If y is lambda, let's plug it into this, Y is lambda. Let's plug it into x squared equals lambda 4y cubed to get x squared is 4 lambda to the 4. And so x. Actually, I don't even need to solve for x. x squared is that, and then plug in x to the four, x squared plus y to the four is equal to five. x squared is this. y was lambda, so y to the four is lambda to the four. So that's equal to five, and so you see that Lambda to the four is five, so lambda is one, is one, is one, is one, is one, sorry. And so lambda is plus or minus one. And if lambda is one, then what? If lambda is one, Lambda is one, then y is one, and x is plus or minus two. And if lambda is negative one, y is negative one, and again, x is plus or minus two. So this gives us a bunch of points. Let's put everything together. What points Let's call them points of importance. So z 
zero, four through to five, zero, negative four through to five, right from here. And then one, two, one minus two, minus one, two, and minus one, minus two, these four points. So if that's what you meant by keeping track of the pairings, absolutely right. And there we have it. So now, whatever value is largest at these points is going to be the absolute max. Whatever value is smallest is going to be the absolute min. Your function, which was x squared y, your function at zero plus or minus four through five is easily seen to be zero at both of these points. The function at plus or minus one root and two is easily seen to be two. Then the function at plus or minus one minus two is easily seen to be minus two. So you see what is happening here. This is the absolute max. This is the absolute min. How are we doing here? Questions? Are the points two, one? Oh no, what have I done? What have I done? Thank you. These are not the points. These are not the points, it's the X. Minus two, one, two, one. And two minus one, and minus two minus one. Thank you, thank you, this is completely wrong. Let's fix it. Let's fix it when x is plus or minus 2 and y is 1, we get 4. And when x is plus or minus 2 and y is minus 1, we get a minus 2. Well, not much harm done there, but you're, you're right. So, sorry about that. Here we go. How did we get the five? This was when, when we were looking at the partial derivative with respect to x. We had two x, y equal to um, lambda 2x. So when you bring this to the other side, you get 2xy minus lambda 2x is equal to zero, factor out of 2x. So you've got a product equal to zero. Either x is equal to zero or that is equal to zero. And when x was equal to zero, coupled with x squared plus y to the four, is equal to 5, you see that y to the 4 has to be equal to 5, and so you get these two values. Exactly as Gabriel suggested.
Um, yeah, I... Instead, instead of viewing it as traveling on the gradient, I prefer to view it uh, from the intersection of the two level curves. Is there a certain amount of points that we are going that we are looking to get before plugging? No, no, it's it's not it's not a question of how many points. It's a question of solving. So don't start with a preconceived idea of how many points you should have. Just go with the flow. The question will naturally yield its solutions. We'll get to that momentarily, James. But before we do, what I wanted to point out is that different books have a slightly different approach to this idea of Lagrange multipliers, right? Remember that we are looking for, or at least the way the book, our book suggests, we are looking for the gradients to be multiples of each other. If you bring this to the other side, this is equivalent to this. Or, you know, since lambda is a constant, it could be negative or positive, whatever. So, If you replace lambda with negative lambda, you get this. Some books like to define a Lagrange operator. operator L as F plus lambda G. And so if you take the gradient of L, which is the gradient of this thing, This is really just the gradient of F plus lambda the gradient of G. And so you're looking for where this is zero. You're looking for critical points of L, critical points of the Lagrange operator. It's, of course, you recognize that it's Exactly the same thing. Well, exactly right. I mean, uh, for those of you making a link to uh, 133, what you're showing is that lambda is an eigenvalue of the Lagrange operator. Exactly. So a beautiful connection to linear algebra once again. This is really just an eigenvalue problem. Let's take another example.
an eigenvalue is yeah, exactly that, as Juan Carlos suggested. Uh, a number such that a v is equal to lambda v where v is not zero. Because of course, if v is zero, this is always true. Here, a is a matrix. This can be replaced by a linear operator. So L v equals lambda v if L is a linear operator. And here, you've got some linear thing. So, I mean, uh, let's not dwell on the fact that this can be viewed as that, but rather on the process itself. Subject to a function, that, that, that's the boundary part. Mies is asking how to visualize the subject to a function mean. Well, it's not subject to a function, right? It's rather subject to an equation. And this is the boundary. This can be viewed as the boundary. That's the idea. So, so that's the relationship between what we were doing before and now, right? So it's, it, th this is the restricting to the boundary part. This Lagrange multipliers business can be used to restrict your function to the boundary. All right, so, right, I mean, here we're moving to 3D. If this wasn't there, this would have been a sphere, right? And with this, it's just an ellipsoid, right? The X is slightly different. So it's like the the surface of a lemon, if you will, or something, egg shape, there it is. So this is just the surface of the egg shape. And we have this function hovering above in a fourth dimension, and we're looking for the max and min. So, so your G, and again, you know, some books do things slightly different, right? Some books will define G to be 2x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus 24 equal to zero, right? If you're picking up a book and you're doing it this way, here it's with the understanding that you've rewritten everything in terms of G equal to zero. So that's the slight difference. If you're, and you know, I mean, the free online resources we offered, I don't know what they're doing. So who knows? Maybe they're doing it this way, maybe they're doing it a different way. The point is, if you have, if you define L to be F plus lambda G, then your G needs to be equal to zero here. So what are we looking for? We're looking for critical points. So Lx is equal to zero. And L lambda equal to zero. This giving us that thing right here. Right? So this is Fx plus lambda Gx. This is Fy plus lambda Gy. This is Fz plus lambda Gz. And this is just the G. Because when you treat this as a variable, the derivative with respect to lambda is just G. So two different ways to view it, 
of course, giving you the same answer because in the end, it's still this coupled with that. Right, let's not do it this way though. What does this mean? This is fx, fy, fz. And this is lambda gx, gy, gz. Right? So if these two things are equal, this means that fx is lambda g of x. Now, for those of you who were wondering why it was equal to zero, well, it's exactly because of this. If you bring this to the other side, you get that. So it's equal to zero. So like I said, it's two ways to, to do it. So this and that. That along with your g equal to zero. Right, so what is fx? Derivative of f with respect to x, e to the xyz times yz. Derivative of g with respect to x is 4x. Derivative of f with respect to y derivative with respect to z and lastly the original solving these four equations, right? You've got four equations, four unknowns. What are we going to do? Why don't we multiply this first one by x and multiply the second one by y? Well, I mean, it's tempting to use matrices here, but the problem is they're not linear, right? Here you've got exponentials. Is a lambda missing in the third equation? Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. So if I multiply the first one by x, you see what happens, right? On the left, you get e to the x, y, z times x, y, z. And on the right, this is 4 lambda x squared. And if I multiply this one by y, I get again an e to the x, y, z times x, y, z. 2 lambda y squared. So if I subtract the 2, If I subtract the two, these disappear. So you get four lambda x squared minus two lambda y squared is equal to zero. You can factor out a two lambda and you get this. So, so 
Well, that's good. If you multiply this one by Z, and compare these two, right? So these two together, we get e to the xyz times xyz is two lambda y squared. And this one here So if you subtract the two again, these disappear, and we get two lambda y squared minus two lambda z squared is equal to zero. So if you factor out a two lambda, you get y squared minus z squared is equal to zero. All right. So what can happen? Either lambda is equal to zero or y is plus or minus root two x. And here, lambda is equal to zero or y is plus or minus z. Do we want to call it the opposite? z is plus or minus y. Right, so here y is plus or minus that, z is plus or minus y, so you can So you see what's happening, right? So first of all, why don't we investigate what happens if lambda is zero? If lambda is zero, from here, we see that yz is zero. Well, should, shall we call it, should we give these names? Let's call this one, two, and three. If lambda is zero from one, we see that So y times z has to be zero. One of these has to be zero. And somebody's asking, why do we multiply by x, y, z, right? And that's the trick you're picking up. We want to solve. How can we solve in a nice, simple way? This is the way to do it. When you multiply this by x, you get e to the x, y, z times x, y, z on the left. When you multiply this by y, you get the same thing on the left. So you can subtract them and they have disappeared. Really, you do whatever you want to do. The point is you have to solve for x, y, and z. As long as you don't do anything illegal, whatever you want to do is up to you. But I'm suggesting that this is a nice trick to pick up, multiply by whatever you need so that you can subtract and eliminate. So from, if lambda is zero from the first one, we get one of y or z is zero. So y is equal to zero, or z is equal to zero. And if y is equal to zero, 
If y is equal to zero, the third one is equal to zero, so that's fine. But from the second one, we get that from two, we get that x is equal to zero or z is equal to zero. So, so if x and y are zero, from this one, which we'll call four, so if x and y are equal to zero, from four, we see that z is plus or minus square root of 24. If x is not zero, then z has to be zero. And again from four, y and z are zero, so x has to be plus or minus root 12. And finally, I don't want to erase that. Probably don't want to erase too much here. Let's try to fit that in somewhere here. What have we done? We've investigated the y equals zero business. So if y is not zero, then z has to be zero. And if z is zero, right? What th this is, of course, with lambda is equal to zero. So if z is zero, we're fine here. Lambda is equal to zero. Y is not zero. So we need x to be zero from equation three. And if x and z are both zero, then y is plus or minus square root of 24 from equation four. I seem to be losing people left and right. We're just solving. We're just solving, making sure x, y, and z satisfy all four equations. So from here, we concluded one of two things, either lambda is zero or this is zero, right? You've got a product equal to zero. A lambda equal to zero, we have investigated here and we have come up with important points. Why don't we write them down somewhere? So let's say this, lambda equals zero yields points of importance what are they? Zero, zero, plus or minus root 24. Or y and z are zero, x is plus or minus root 12. Or x and z are zero, y is plus or minus root 24. Uh, somebody's asking how we're supposed to figure this out on your own. It's simple algebra, right? Three equa four equations, four unknowns. It 
It looks more complicated than it actually is. And I'm offering one nice trick. Multiply so that stuff cancels. Right, so here, this gave us this. This was the case if lambda was zero. Oh, well, I mean, we're, we're going to do that right now, Marie, right? We, we have to start somewhere. So we started with lambda equal to zero. So now we can assume lambda is not zero. So if lambda is not zero, then you need both of these things to occur. So if lambda is not zero, y has to be plus or minus root two x, and z has to be plus or minus y. So let's look at one of these. If y is root two x, and z is y, uh, actually it's probably not going to make any difference here, well, but anyways, let's take this, so let's take y equals the positive and z equals the positive, and then we had 2x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to 24, but y is root 2x, so 2x squared plus 2x squared, and z is root 2x. It's 2, 4, 6. 6x six squared is 24, so x squared is 4 and x is plus or minus root two. So you see what happens here. If x is two, we get the point two, two root two, two root two. And if x is minus two, we get the point minus two, minus two root two, minus two root two. But now, what if y is that, and z is minus y, right? We have to look at all possible options. If y is root two x, and z is negative y, so negative root two x. We absolutely need both conditions to be true. I've rubbed it off now, but since lambda was not zero, both are needed. So if this, now plug everything back into that, again, then we get 2x squared plus 2x squared again, plus 2x squared is equal to 24. So x is again plus or minus 2. And in this case, if x is positive 2, we get 2, 2 root 2, minus 2 root 2. And if x is minus 2, we get minus 2, minus 2 root 2, and positive 2 root 2. I, I want 
from somebody's asking why we didn't investigate when y is zero and z is not equal to zero. I think we did. When y is zero and z is not equal to zero, we got this solution. And we're halfway done, right? Now we're going to investigate what happens if, if y is negative root 2 and z is equal to y. So negative root 2x. Well, let's cheat here, because you know what's going to come, you know what's going to happen, right? You're going to get x equals 2, y equals minus 2 root 2, and z equals minus 2 root 2. And if x is minus 2, you get 2 root 2 and 2 root 2. I'm doing this in the interests. Sanity. This, I'm sure you see what's going to happen. And in this case, you're going to get two minus two root two minus two root two. Sorry, this is plus and minus two, two root two, and minus two root two. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You see that you get all the possible combinations. So now, what were we looking for? Remember, your function was e to the x, y, z. So on these three values, right? So shall, shall I call this p1, p2, and p3? Let's uh, not. And let me point out that f at all of these points are going to be the same. They're all equal to 1. All of these, as we suggest, all of these occurred when lambda was not equal to zero. Whereas these up here occurred where lambda was zero. But, but you know, we're, we're pretty smart, right? And you recognize that as soon as one of them is zero, the whole thing is e to the zero, which is one. So there isn't much plugging in to do here. 
And what about these ones? Well, you see that they're all the same numbers, plus or minus. So it's going to be plus or minus the product. And the maximum is going to occur when the product is positive. So the maximum of e to the 2 times 2 root 2 times 2 root 2, which is 2, 4, 8, 16, the maximum is going to be e to the 16, and that's going to occur when they're all positive, or two of them are negative, and one is positive. So this occurs at 2, 2 root 2, 2 root 2, and at 2 minus 2 root 2, minus 2 root 2, or uh, minus 2, 2 root 2, minus 2 root 2, or at minus 2, minus 2 root 2, 2 root 2. And the other one, which is going to be e to the negative 1 over 16, nothing important happens there, because you know that's a positive number, and, oh no, I was a bit hasty there, sorry. For some reason, I thought this was zero, but in fact, it's one. So max occurring there, and the min points. I don't know that y is special or x. Well, x because because of your uh, of your boundary, right? It was two x squared plus y squared plus z squared. When lambda is equal to one, I'm, I'm not sure where the lambda equals to one played a role there. Do we have time for one more? Hopefully it's a quick one. Let me point out that this idea generalizes to more constraints. If you have a function that you want to maximize or minimize is subject to more than one constraint, And so, as you pointed out, when lambda is zero, we don't get an absolute max or an absolute minute. It could be something more. Okay, it could be a local, who knows. Absolutely, Gabriel is suggesting more constraints could mean that there is no possibility 
or uh, then there's no solution. Absolutely. But I mean, of course, I suspect these questions are manufactured so that uh, you do have an answer. Right, so here, what going to do is add another, add another lambda. So if you, if you define G and H, we're going to want the gradient of F to be a combination. Right, so for those of you who may have missed it, if you were buffering, two, two constraints now instead of just one, right? And the only difference is gradient of F has to be a combination of gradient of G and gradient of H. So a new, a new lambda here, let's call it mu, and there it is. So let's do it, right, Fx has to be lambda gx plus mu hx. What is that? This is 2x is equal to lambda times 1 plus mu times 0. And similarly, the derivative with respect to y Finally, the derivative with respect to z, lambda times 0 plus mu times minus 2z, and coupled with these two equations again. So you see what's going on, right? Five equations, five unknowns, whatever you want to do. Solve it as you wish. It's really up to you. Uh, what do I want to do? Well, from the first one, it's clear that x is lambda over 2. And from here, if I bring this to the other side, I get 2z plus 2z mu is equal to zero. So if I factor out a 2z, I get one plus mu. So either z is equal to zero or mu is negative one. If z is equal to zero. If z equal to zero, then y is plus or minus one from this one. And if y is one from this one, you get that x is two. And if y is minus 1, from the same equation, you get that x is 0. So if z is 0, you already have a bunch of points. What points do we have? 0 minus 1 is 0. Right, x equals 0, y equals minus 1, 
z equals zero or two one zero. So that's the z equal to zero case. So let's assume z is not zero. Then mu has to be minus one. And if mu is minus, no. What happens if mu is minus one? From this second equation, what do we get? 2y is equal to minus lambda. Mu is minus one, so that is minus 2y. So 4y is minus lambda, and y is minus lambda over 4. And now you have both x and y in terms of lambda, so we can use this one. x is lambda over 2. y is minus lambda over 4. And x minus y is 1. So what is that? This is 3 lambda over 4 is equal to 1. So lambda is 4 over 3. Which means that x is half of that, 2 over 3. Where is this z equal to 1 business? Then z equals 1. Maybe. Maybe z equal to 1. Are you using this one? Very good. Very good. That's fine. Right? I mean, there isn't one absolute way to solve these. Whatever you want to do. Let's just finish that up quickly. x is equal to this. y is equal to minus lambda over four, so minus one third. And I suspect what am I suspecting? Suspecting issues to arise probably. Uh, if I plug this into that, I see, what do I see? I see one over nine minus z squared is equal to one. And, and we're in trouble. And we're in trouble right here. Right, this is never equal to one. Dan was getting z equals one from here. But then if z is equal to 1, you'll probably get something, some contradiction involving these two. What this means is that there's no solution from the lambda equals negative 1. From, from mu equals negative one. Possibly complex, but we're not going to discuss that. So these are the only two points. Riemann, uh, the Riemann hypothesis is, is way too complicated for me. So our function which was x squared plus y squared plus z squared. At this point, it's 1. And at 2, 1, 0, it's 4 plus 1 is 5. And you're done. You're done. This is the min. This is the max.
There it is. How are we doing here? Questions? Anyone? All right. Thank you all for coming then. On, well, next week, we're going to start integration. Is the boundary closed here? Uh, it's, it's a valid question, right? It's a valid question. It's not clear that it actually is. One of them was a plane. The other one was something else. So here we're going to assume that it was, but it's a valid, it's a valid question. probably a bit too complicated for us, or it would take a lot of analysis. But I mean, in these questions, I think you can safely assume that it is a closed boundary. The final exam is cumulative. Absolutely. So it will cover everything we covered in class. All right, so like I said, next week, we're going to start uh, integration in several variables. We're going to generalize the integral to higher dimensions. You guys have a good weekend, and I will see you then.